thank you for the intro. Thanks for sticking around, everyone. Um, today I'm going to be talking about a collaborative effort between myself at CBNIR and VIMS and Dr. A.J. Johnson and Dr. J.J. Orth at VIMS and also Dr. Gary Kendrick from the University of Western Australia. So my six words, uh, they don't actually have much to do with the presentation, but um, I've just never felt more thankful than I have this past year to be able to work underwater uh, in such a beautiful habitat. Um, it always provides me a sense of calm and peace, uh, no matter the chaos that might be going on in the world around me. So we often talk about seagrasses as important refuges for you know, critters. And so um, it, it, seagrasses are refuges for people too. All right, so on to the science. Um, I'm going to be talking about eelgrass in the polyhaline regions of the bay. So this plot is from the VEMS uh, seagrass annual mapping surveys that they do every year. And this is showing the coverage of seagrass and hectares from the polyhaline region um, going back just before 1980. So you can see this, um, these oscillations in coverage. And we had these increases through the 80s into the 90s, and then some declines through the 90s into the 2000s. And then what we see more recently are these periods of um, sharp decline, followed by some recovery with another sharp decline. And kind of that, that pattern is holding into present. So this work focuses specifically on these dieback events from uh, during 2005 and then also 2018. Um, so we know uh, there's been a lot of work that's been done researching the causes for these declines. And we found that um, largely temperature is the driver. So eelgrass is a temperate species. This map is showing it. Um, its distribution throughout the world in orange. And we in the Chesapeake Bay are near the southern, southern limits of its distribution. It does grow in North Carolina, a little bit south of us, but we are near the limits. So any increases in water temperature can be really stressful for this species. Um, and so we've done some work looking at this. And this graph on the top is showing, um, it's based on water temperatures in the York River. And what we did was based on some, um, you know, tolerance ranges that we know of for eelgrass, we calculated a length of season and total days um, for the, the stressful summer season that the eelgrass is experiencing. And this length of season has increased over the years. So eelgrass growing now is exposed to much uh, longer periods of stressful temperatures than um, it previously was. And the graph on the bottom is showing some work that we did at Goodwin Islands near the mouth of the York River, looking at monthly percent change in eelgrass coverage, comparing that to the percent time that temperatures were above 28 degrees um, and during the summer. And 28 degrees is kind of this threshold value for eelgrass, where when you start to get above that, it really starts to uh, die back. And so what we found with this work was that if you if um, you have temperatures above 28 greater than 40 percent of the time, um, you can be seeing these mass mortality events where we're losing greater than 50 percent of, of the eelgrass. OK, so the 2005 declines. Um, we relate, were related to above normal water temperatures in the summer. We also had above normal water temperatures in 2018, but combined with that, we had this really anomalous um, precipitation year. So this graph, Dave Parrish from CB Near put together, and um, it's showing the salinity event that occurred from all this precipitation and discharge coming into the York River, um, and what, then what happened to the salinity at Goodwin Islands. So the salinity daily means are in purple here. And um, this is plotted against the uh, range of what more normal salinities were historically at this site. And so starting in the spring of 2018, this event continued into the summer of 
2019, where we had some really low salinities um, at this site. And salinities of 10 to 15 alone may not uh, cause mortality for eelgrass, but combined with some more st uh, stressors such as warm water temperatures and possibly low light conditions, all of these stressors can have a synergistic effect. So these dieback events provide some really unique opportunities uh, to evaluate the resilience of eelgrass populations in the bay or their ability to resist or survive these environmental perturbations. Um, and so I put this quote up here from Dr. Jessie Jarvis, who is now at UNC Wilmington. She's done a lot of research in this area. And it's just to highlight um, the importance of looking at the life history strategies of these seagrasses in order to be able to uh, effect effectively predict their response to future environmental um, conditions and ultimately in order to manage the species. So eelgrass has, can reproduce both asexually and sexually. So it, can, it forms these rhizomes where it will produce a new shoot, uh, multiple shoots along the rhizome. It also produces sexually, reproduces sexually through these reproductive shoots that form these seeds that then fall out um, and into the sediment, creating a sediment seed bank, which uh, then the seeds can germinate the following fall and winter. And so <clears throat> eelgrass in the Chesapeake Bay has a perennial life history. So it's out there all year round. Um, and the seedlings typically do not flower in their first year of growth. And so this leaves these perennial beds really susceptible to consecutive years of loss due to their inability to replenish the seed bank. So today I'm gonna to be focused on three primary objectives that we looked at. First, to compare the importance of surviving adult clones or newly established seedlings to population recovery after two distinct dieback events. We evaluate whether surviving clones or newly established seedlings contributed more shoots and structure in the recovering population in 2019. And we relate the differences in adult clone survival to environmental characteristics across the sampled regions after the 2018 dieback event. And I just wanna mention that this work has been recently published in Estuaries and Coasts. It's in a special issue called Seagrasses, a tribute to Susan Williams. Uh, Dr. Williams was the um, director of the Bode Bodega Marine Lab at UC Davis and I was on the faculty at UC Davis. And um, she tragically passed away in 2018. And with that, um, you know, the, the world and the seagrass community really lost an exceptional scientist, uh, educator and mentor, and particularly a, a role model for women in science. And so a bunch of seagrass scientists from all over the world got together and put the special issue together um, to honor her. And so there's 24 um, seagrass papers in this issue. So if you are able and you get a chance to check it out, I encourage you to do so. So uh, our methods, we identified eight regions in the lower Chesapeake Bay. Um, the majority of them are you know, York River, Goodwin Islands, uh, Mob Jack Bay and that area. But we do have one um, on the Eastern Shore, Hungers, the, the Bay side Eastern Shore. Within these eight regions, we identified uh, random sampling sites that we pinpointed based on the aerial survey. So we were only looking at areas that were mapped as dense SAV. Um, so we sampled in spring of 2006 and then in 2019. So the, that's the spring following these two dieback events. At each site, we put three meter squared quadrats down and counted seedlings and adult plants as well as flowering shoots. And then in 2019, we also counted the individual number of shoots on each adult and seedling. So these graphs are comparing the years 2006 to 2019. So 2006 is gray, 2019 is black. And um, the graph on the left is showing of, of all the plants we counted, what percentage of those were adults rather than seedlings. 
So what we found was that there were fewer adults present in 2019 compared to 2006, and this resulted in fewer flowering shoots in 2019 compared to 2006. So you'll remember that if, you're, if a grass bed is coming back primarily from seedlings um, rather than adult shoots, those seedlings aren't going to produce seeds their first year. So uh, you're not going to find a lot of flowering shoots. And that's what we saw. We actually, these are total flowering shoots counted in all of the surveys, and we found zero uh, in, the, in the York River at all of our sites in the York in 2019. So this is focusing just on 2019, where we actually counted individual shoots. And so the adults are in gray and the seedlings are in black. Um, so we found that seedlings contributed significantly more shoots to total shoot abundance than adults after this 2018 dieback. But we did see a lot of site variability. So you'll um, notice that Hungers Creek had almost as many adults as seedlings, while Goodwin had zero surviving adults. We did not find a single uh, surviving adult at Goodwin and only two in um, the other York River sites. All right, so with all the site variability, we really wanted to see if we could pinpoint some, some drivers for this. So uh, I'm not gonna get into really the details of this model, but we ended up with a generalized linear mix effects model where um, we had the number of adults surviving in 2019 as the um, response variable. And then the predictor variables, we calculated these anomaly values. So we were looking at how different or anomalous 2018 was compared to previous years for water temperature and salinity. And then we had site within region and position within site as nested random variables. And we found this negative relationship between regions more anomalous in temperature and salinity and the survival of adult clones in the region. So uh, regions that were most impacted by the hot water and the low salinity um, of 2018, such as Goodwin and York, had fewer surviving adults than those regions such as Hungers, which were uh, least impacted. All right, so some conclusions. Um, seagrass is growing in areas predicted to experience greater environmental extremes may need to rely more on sexual reproduction and recovery from seedlings in order to persist. And this brings up some uh, issues for perennial eelgrass for a variety of reasons. One being that there's just a lot of natural variability in flowering intensity and seed banks within perennial beds. And so it's they can be very hard to predict how they're going to respond. Um, there's also a huge vulnerability of seedlings. So seedlings don't compete well with adult shoots. Um, they are very vulnerable when they're at that really small seedling stage and many of them don't survive. Um, and also what I talked about earlier is that seedlings uh, just typically don't flower in their first year, so they're not able to replenish the seed bank. So extreme weather events associated with climate change places these populations at risk. All right, well, so that's all kind of bummer news, but you know, so what can we do about it? Uh, where do we go from here? Well, we know that perennial life history is not the only strategy that plants use. Um, annual life history strategies in plants have evolved as an adaptive response to stressful and unpredictable environmental conditions. And in fact, uh, just south of us in North Carolina, there are some annual populations of eelgrass where they completely die out uh, every summer when the water temperatures become too hot and they come back from seeds every year. And uh, so similar reproductive strategies may prove successful in the Chesapeake Bay, but we just have not uh, observed them here yet. And so we need to be exploring the potential for the emergence of such strategies in the Bay. And there's really a huge need for innovative thinking on this. So um, how, for example, how would annual eelgrass do in the Bay if it was transplanted up here? Um, are there any genetic or metabolic differences in heat tolerance between the North Carolina plants and the Chesapeake Bay plants? What can we learn from some of these more resilient eelgrass populations in other areas to help make the Chesapeake Bay eelgrass more resilient? Um, 
we know that water temperature is going to continue to warm and these kind of storm uh, or extreme climatic events uh, are predicted to, to occur with more frequency. So tackling some of these questions is really of critical importance right now. All right. Thank you.